The debate on the polio vaccine has tonight taken a different twist with a polio victim going to court to stop the Catholic Church from campaigns against the vaccination. According to him, it is a violation of human rights. The Director of Medical Services, Dr. Nicholas Muraguri, says 2.8 million children have received the vaccine and the ministry is targeting 6 million. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church has told its members to boycott the polio vaccination until underlying issues are resolved. The church says it has valid health concerns. Parents have been caught in between and are wondering who to listen to. The health of their children is at risk and on the other hand the Catholic Church has a lot of influence as well in this society. This is KTN Prime and apart from that polio debate we'll be crossing over to the North Rift region where Masikandie will be focusing on a different story that has given a lot of uh, hope for the residents there, sort of a new lease of life. This is KTN Prime. These are the other stories we'll be focusing on for you tonight. All your victims takes the Catholic Church to court over its campaign against the vaccination. <laughs> Disaster at a Limoru school as fire claims three lives. a very big danger to uh, private developers. I am appealing to the National Land Commission to spare us this bustle and hassle. Head teachers now demand titles for their schools. <laughs> Strategies to boost security in all universities in the country. Many thanks for joining us tonight. Our sign language interpreter there at the bottom end of your screen is Meresha Owiti. As we told you earlier, the debate on polio vaccine has tonight taken a different twist with a polio victim going to court to stop the Catholic Church from campaigning against that vaccination and that uh, discussion forms the basis of a big question tonight. We're asking you, should the government stop the polio vaccination campaign? That is how we begin this conversation tonight. Once again, the big question, should the government stop the polio vaccination campaign? The Big Q, in association with Thika School of Medical and Health Sciences. It is a conversation that has involved the church, uh, the medical uh, practitioners as well, and indeed the government, that vaccination against polio. And we're asking you on KTN Prime tonight, should the government stop the polio vaccination campaign? You can tweet us at KTN Kenya. You can tweet me at Linda Guto. I'd love to sample some of your views because this is indeed a big conversation that is not just being held in Kenya, but in the region as well, if at all the region has to eradicate polio from its borders. Let's turn our attention to the International Criminal Court. The lawyer of the victims of the post-election violence has filed a case before the ICC seeking a review of President Uhuru Kenyatta's case. The lawyer wants the court to lift its decision against investigating Kenyatta and his former co-accused. The prosecutions of Ambassador Francis Mudaura and Hussein Ali collapsed in 2012 while Kenyatta's was dropped last year. The lawyer claims the cases collapsed following a systematic campaign of this state to obstruct access to evidence relevant to the charges. He also claims that efforts were made to bribe key witnesses. That's a story we are keeping an eye on for you and we'll let you know the developments therein. Let's bring you back to the country. A third student has succumbed to his injuries following a fire at Steph Joy Boys High School in Limuru. Eight other students are receiving treatment. And as KTN's Ian Wafula reports, the police are following leads that the fire may have been started by some of the students. <laughs> When the school's administration summoned her urgently to school, she did not know what awaited her. All she had been told was that her nephew was unwell following an accident in his school. <laughs> she promptly made arrangements to travel from Mombasa, and upon her arrival in Nairobi, that is when hell broke loose. 
her nephew was presented to her in a body bag. But she wasn't the only one. The family of the second student who perished during Sunday night's fire were inside the dormitory where their son took his last breath. From the face, hey. identified ears. You can't identify From the roof, are you seeing it ears? Mm. Mm. While investigations into the incident are ongoing, there are reports that the fire could have been started by a section of the students at around 10 p.m. as they retired for the day. I found the school was calm. All the boys um, had, had, had assembled at the field. And then the, the, the injured ones were also in the field. So when the ambulance came, we put them in and they were rushed to hospital. We are investigating uh, the cause of the fire, whether it was, uh, it was a criminal act. We have some 10 students who are in uh, custody uh, for interrogations uh, to assist us in uh, processing the, the, whole, uh, the whole case. Uh, but from our own observation is that there are quite a number of issues that need to be addressed. Thorough analysis of the school's dormitory brought to the fore some of the loopholes on the safety measures in place. Ndegwa Muhoro, uh, when, he met, when he went into the uh, scene, he mentioned that it's not up to standard because if you look, he says the windows were a bit small and the doors are also small. Uh, and so some of the students might not have been able to rush out of the scene when the fire Well, well I, I, don't, I don't want to disagree with him, uh, but um, um, you see, if you look at the structures, you see, number one, the rules, the rules, the ministry rules are that, number one, the doors should open from out, I mean, from inside going out. And all our doors, all our dome doors, our glass doors, open, open from inside going out. When you check on our windows, okay, um, none of them has agreed. The only thing is that the size of our windows is maybe what we, we did not put into consideration. But the school's administration is not new to this kind of a disaster. Last week at the sister school, Steph Joy Girls, the students had set ablaze part of the dormitory. Fortunately, no casualties were reported, but the school was closed down. And there are many incidents of fires in schools and of great concern to all of us. And that is the reason why we called a stakeholders forum to put our heads together to see exactly what is uh, bedeviling in the education sector. Yes, and, and we looked at um, the many other reports in the past that have been uh, uh, submitted by committees appointed by government to investigate and come up with the solutions and the way forward on issues. We need to have a look, a second look at one. When we admit our children, into schools like this what levels of security and safety are we going to put for the children what wh what system are we going to put in place to ensure that there is continuous invigilation there is continuous fact finding and information collection within the students so that we are able to know are there things that could be happening that could probably rupture into something as big as this one of the students with serious injuries was admitted at the Kenyatta National Hospital with doctors saying that he had 95% of burns on his body while eight others were admitted at the Tigoni Hospital. As the parents and students of Steph Joy Boys High School await investigations into this particular incident, the Minister of Education says that all schools must ensure that safety measures have been put in place to avoid uh, such outcomes. Ian Ofula, KTN News. Let's take it to the coast now. The contentious debate on title dates for public schools was revived at the Kenya Primary Schools Heads Association's meeting. Head teachers put the government on the spot for allegedly complicating the process, thus subjecting them to the mercy of land grabbers. KTN's Francis Ontomo now reports. When the head teachers gathered for the first round of deliberations in the ongoing conference, one discussion would poignantly stick out and steal the thunder from the rest. The now rampant land grabbing question was to break the ice, painting the picture just how chronic the scheme of things was. Our schools, nationally, they don't have land title deeds. And it is posing a very big danger to uh, private developers who are actually encroaching schools and we are finding it a big challenge. I am appealing to the National Land Commission to spare us this bustle and hustle of school, committee, school committees, BOMs and head teachers running up and down looking for title deeds. And this will prompt the National Land Commission Chair Mohamed Suzuri to swing into action, igniting the first step in what will see public schools now acquire authentic title deeds. We have also come here with application forms so that all and all of them, 21,000, should those ones who have not should actually pick and fill the application forms, leave, it them, leave them with us, and then we just go and process. 
There are approximately 30,000 public schools across the country which sit on about 210 acres of land. Sadly though, a good chunk of it is still not fully protected. This has consequently for ages opened doors for land grabbers, but now their days could be numbered. We sounded it in October, the president gave the directive in December, we sounded it again, we gave a directive that on uh, up to 31st of March we extended it. We are still saying that there is no room, no, there is no more room for land grabbers of public schools. Title deeds have in the past been used as baits for political maneuvers, something that the Parliamentary Committee on Education once addressed to make it easier for schools to process the all-important document. I would not like the issue of uh, titles to be politicized. I um, would like it to be taken uh, with a very sober note uh, because we know there are some grabbers who have come in and they have encroached um, on uh, schools and public institutions, uh, property, not only the primary schools, even secondary, some of the polytechnics. You go find those polytechnics somewhere and now there is some structure coming up in a private person. Many benefits accrue to authentic land ownership, which include accessing funds for development and expansion of infrastructure. Some NGOs who donor us or help us, they need title dudes just to make sure we are really registered. Even some services from the government, they ask title deeds, and even just to protect school land. Tuesday promises to be another action-packed day with two cabinet secretaries, Professor Jacob Kaimeni of Education and Dr. Fred Matiangi of ICT, expected to address the teachers. Stemming the systemic land grabbing menace among public schools here in the country has been one of the biggest discussions here in the 11th edition of the Kenya Primary Schools Heads Association's meeting. And there are unanimous calls that those schools that are yet to acquire their title dates, their process be hastened. Francis Ontomwa, KTN News, Mombasa. Let's stay with education but link it a little bit to security. The government is proposing a raft of measures to ensure security in universities which are considered soft targets for terrorists. Police posts will be set up in major universities as the government considers amendments to the law to allow private security guards in universities to carry firearms. Rita Tinina reports on the new measures proposed by Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Mkaiseri during a gathering of university administrators from around the country. The attack on the Garissa University College, which left 147 people dead, prompted fresh focus on security measures in universities. Thank you. The week started with university vice chancellors and other senior university officials converging to seek the best ways to secure institutions of higher learning. With minimal presence of the police, security in universities and constituent colleges is mainly handled by private security firms whose guards are unarmed. The government says it is looking into ways of changing that. We are looking at the law whether we can allow them to, 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 to have um, arms so that they can be able to supplement the security organ. And the major universities may have more than just armed security guards. We can have police station or police post in this university. In April, an explosion from a power transformer was mistaken for a terror attack, causing a scare at the University of Nairobi's Kikuyu campus, which saw some students jump from the fifth floor of their hostel. Mkaiseri wants students to be trained in emergency and evacuation procedures. So that all students know what to do in an emergency situation. The Interior Cabinet Secretary also proposed one measure that will no doubt be a controversial subject. Sometimes also your students are also a threat to, to communities and you know this yourself because when they, they don't get what they want, they vent their emotions to the public, you know, and so we need to relocate this institution far away from he challenged universities to conduct research on the radicalization of the youth. Former university students have been identified among those working for the Al-Shabaab. We have one Ahmed Iman who is the head of video and propaganda in Al-Shabaab. He is a former graduate of JQ Art. We also have uh, Lukman Osman Issa, the one who did participate in the recent Bauri attack. He is a student from uh, a university in Uganda. We have Abdulaman Abdullahi who was among the attackers at the Garissa University College. We also have uh, one called Sadir Abdallah 
also a third year university student from the International University of Africa School of Medicine. We have another student who blew himself up when he was caught at the Pangani Police Station, also a former university student of Nairobi University. Many universities have reviewed their security since the Garissa attack with the installation of CCTV cameras among measures embraced by some universities. But for institutions considered as soft targets, university administrators will not be resting easy on matters security. Rita Tinina, KTN News. You're watching KTN Prime. We thank you for staying with us. Let's now take you all the way to the North Rift where Mercy Kandi is standing by Mercy. There is a new lease of life for diabetic patients down there. What's going on? Yes, Linda. First of all, Linda, the numbers are staggering. Worldwide about 300 million people are living with diabetes. In Kenya alone, 2 million of those are living with diabetes with 100 new cases daily. But in the Kerio Valley, a very tough terrain, the elderly especially are benefiting from the new technology that they are being given from a medical outreach. Listen in to this story from the Kerio Valley. It's about 9 a.m. The clouds hang from the Kerio Valleys. It gets very cold in the morning before the heat in the valleys becomes unbearable. Braving the cold, Gogo Taplele leads her two friends for the free medical outreach. It comes only twice a month. They know too well they have to take full advantage of the opportunity. So everyone takes a seat, waiting patiently for their turn. Today, they are tested for sugar levels. They are given free glucometer kits for diabetes testing. Before we give these clients the kits, we, we used to have uh, like frequent emergency cases of high blood sugar at the facility. So they use actually to come like, when we are called, there is a client at a certain village and he's not even able to reach the facility. The first free kits were given out in 2012. Among those who got one then was 65-year-old Shokwoi Kiprop. Today, she visits the Field Marsham Medical Center. Her sugar levels have been fluctuating. It's the same center that gave her the kit and free medicine to manage her diabetes. diabetes. <laughs> But injecting oneself was no easy task. She had to be taught and master the guts to do so. It helps to give the glucometer test kit for free because in the rugged terrain where reaching health facilities is tough for the old especially, the kits are used to test family and friends as well. We have been able to inform them that the, like diabetic disease, some, uh, most of the cases run in their family and we advise them actually to screen their family members, their neighbors, their relatives, so that also we can be able to beat uh, cases of diabetes as early as uh, the manager posted. <laughs> Back at the outreach program, many others arrive. Majority are the elderly. With every step they strive to make, knowing that it's these same steps that help them to maintain their health. The early morning cold is no excuse to take better living for granted. Masi Kandiakatian at the Kerio Valley, El Geomaraquet County. So there you have it, Linda. Um, the elderly especially are learning to, you know, take note of their sugar levels and use this same uh, kit to ensure that they don't take too much medicine, but just the right content or no medicine at all. Linda.
Great initiative there, Masikandia. Thank you so much from the North Rift. The Public Accounts Committee of the National Assembly is dismissing critics of the Auditor General's report over the missing billions. Chairman uh, Nicholas Gumbo says the PSA will summon the Auditor General before the Watchdog Committee. Aaron Ocheng has the details. Institutions that have been named in the Auditor General's report need not make public utterances in dismissing the Edward Oko findings on misappropriation of funds under their watch. Rarieda, member of parliament who heads the Public Accounts Committee, says whereas the report has not been fully scrutinized, those who feel the report does not paint a true picture of the accounts should wait for the right time to do so. There is a procedure to scrutinize what he has presented. Why don't we hold our horses instead of looking like gatekeepers for the executive? Because we are not. According to PSC, the Auditor General will be summoned by Parliament to explain how he came up with the numbers that suggest massive corruption in both national and county government's accounts. We know that the only way, one of the only ways, the best and the most independent ways for us to verify and to know where this corruption is happening is the Auditor, Office of the Auditor General. Let us not condemn that office, particularly our colleagues who have gone public to condemn the Auditor General they are not right in so doing. The Treasury, which is the custodian of public finance and mandated with ensuring compliance, has itself come out to condemn the audit report. So has the Council of Governors, who dismissed the audit report as unprofessional and misleading. What is the Auditor General expected to do if he's looking for documents which somebody is not willing to give? I mean, the only way to do it is say, okay, this has been done. Mm. Even if you came to a building like this parliament, the building has been done all right. But I ask you for the bills of quantities you don't give me. What is wrong in me saying, okay, the building has been done, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't see any supporting document. PSC is also saying that the Auditor General needs to explain to Parliament why his report has delayed for over seven months and if he met any resistance while conducting his audit. That report is before the House now. That report is going, soon going to be uh, before the committee, uh, Parliamentary Accounts Committee, and we will scrutinize penny by penny. We know how difficult the taxpayer goes through to make sure that they pay that, they make that resources available. The Edward Oko team has been summoned to Parliament next week. Aaron Ocheng, K10 News. A polio victim has sued the Catholic Church against its campaign to stop the ongoing polio vaccination exercise. The man claims the church is violating human rights. Now this comes as the Director of Medical Services, Nicholas Muraguri, says 2.8 million children have received the polio vaccine so far. The Ministry of Health is targeting to vaccinate at least 6 million children under the age of 5 by Wednesday. The Catholic Church has told its members to boycott the polio vaccination until underlying issues are resolved. The church has accused the health ministry of not being committed to clear the air on the safety of the vaccine to enable the church to support it. The church says it is not opposed to the immunization program per se, considering polio cases were reported in 2013, but they could not understand the health ministry's reluctance to sample and test the vaccine jointly with the church. The Ministry of Health launched an oral polio vaccination campaign targeting 6 million children below 5 years in 32 high risk counties in response to a polio outbreak in Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia that happened last year. Hello and thank you for keeping it KTN. This it's time for business. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. The government has received a shot in the arm after the Moody's credit agency retained its sovereign debt rating at B1 just weeks after Fitch downgraded the country's rating. In an update to investors, Moody's said that the B1 status is a reflection of Kenya's strong growth potential, leadership role in the East African region and relatively deep capital market. The agency dubbed Kenya as Africa's startup nation thanks to the proliferation of high technology innovation. 
Moody's also lauded the government's decision to sign two simultaneous IMF standby agreements in February, saying it was proof of the country's commitment to structure reforms. The International Monetary Fund approved a standby arrangement and standby credit facility for a total of $688 million to support Kenya's ongoing macroeconomic and institutional reforms. The IMF package provides a policy anchor to strengthen the government's financial management capacity and to support date sustainability. However, Moody's has raised alarm over the fiscal pillagers saying they could lead to an unsustainable date pass. The view comes just days after the Auditor General released a damning report saying government agencies cannot account for more than 67 billion shillings. <coughs> is then ask for, which doesn't make sense in the, in the end, but then ask that for a premium mm -hmm. in the sense that if you've been downgraded, it shows that there's a, an increased risk in the ability to pay on time or pay at all. And so one of the things that they do is the interest rates will arise. Uh, so the kind of interest rates we've, uh, we've, we've been afforded before, by virtue of the fact that people have more confidence in our ability to pay, is going to rise. So a few percentage points, <coughs> a few percentage points here and there. Now for the taxpayer, of course, that means that every additional shilling that we borrow is more expensive than the one that, was, that came uh, before it. And so the pressure is, will uh, the portfolio of debt, the growth rate of the debt, be as high as your overall GDP growth rates. Because if your economy is growing faster than your debt is growing, then it means you'll be able to pay anyway. If it is not, and that's what some of these signals suggest, that, this, that that gap is closing very, very quickly, then what it means is over the future, we'll have to work much harder to pay the debt than what we've been doing before. On his small plot of land in Kikuyu, Peter Shege grows tomatoes barley, lettuce and strawberries on a reservoir of nutrients in water and without soil. Using a technology known as hydroponics, he has eliminated the need to use soil. The farming technology is fast gaining traction in Kenya with most farmers frustrated by the high cost of input with little return. On this week's Next Frontier, Phil Kitani takes us through soil-less farming and some of the benefits it's having for farmers. Arable land is fast becoming a challenge for farmers, with most having to contend with small chunks of land to make a living. But for some ingenious farmers, there is always a way around the challenges. Take Peter Shege for example. Frustrated by low quality of raw grain that he received from his suppliers, he set out to develop a more efficient way of growing cereals that are often used in making animal feed in Kenya. This is how he came up with hydrophonic technology. Instead of soil, you use uh, inert media like uh, pumice, as you can see this, this, uh, these uh, stones, these are inert, they will not react with the, the, the fertilizer. Uh, the, the, the reason why the uh, problem with the fertilizer is uh, it tends to marry the, 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 uh, the soil tends to marry the fertilizer. Though having been in global existence for over 50 years, the technology started gathering pace in Kenya over the last two years, although many smallholder farmers have little or no knowledge about it. A year ago, he upscaled his operation and started building hydrophonic system for interested Kenyan farmers. The shed that housed the system can be as small as 60 cubic meters and can therefore be built on small piece of land, even in peri-urban areas. Peter installs the 60 cubic meter system at a cost of about 100,000 shillings. Operating at capacity, the system can produce 200 kilograms of barley a day for animal fodder, enough to comfortably feed 10 cows. This technology offers a lasting solution to the frequent drought experience in most parts of the country and the need for expensive irrigation system. For 40 days, you harvest as the third day. This is the third day, or fourth day in the morning. That's when you harvest for the 40 at this size. The reason why we don't wait at this stage is because potty does not require a lot of flashage and there will be waste. This will also save farmers from agony of expensive fodder storage facilities and guarantee a constant supply of high quality fodder. Unlike hay and silage, which lose their nutritive value over time, the quality of hydrophonic fodder is always guaranteed since it's feed to farm animals or birds while still fresh. This is what we are doing here as a trial for growing rice. It 
once this one we do it, we can be able now to grow even fishery rice in any part of the country. In a continent where farmers have for years relied on rain-fed agriculture, this could be a solution to food security. It doesn't matter the size of land that you have. What matters is the kind of technology that you apply on your farm. For example, this tray of hydrophonically grown fodder can feed a cow that produces 20 liters of milk daily and only takes 7 days to mature. Philip Kaitan for the next frontier. Thanks a lot, Philip, for that interesting technology for agribusiness. Now, let's move on. And Equity Bank's rollout of Equitel has fast gained traction as well, with the Communications Authority of Kenya revealing that the latest entrant into the mobile telecommunications industry now commands 1.9% uh, market share as of 2014-2015 financial year. The market share for mobile subscriptions in the last quarter lost subscribers to Equitel. Airtel, for instance, lost 2.4% market share to stand at 20.2% down from 22.6% in the previous quarter. Telcom market leader Safaricom saw its market share decline marginally by 0.3% to stand at 67.1% during the period and a review down from 67.4% share reported during the last quarter. The new sector statistics come exactly two weeks after Equity Bank announced it will start offering voice and data services through its new mobile virtual network, Equitel. Equitel runs on infrastructure shared by Airtel and provides voice calls at a standard rate of 4 shillings across all networks and charges one shilling per SMS. Now, news about Kenya Airways shocking 25.74 billion shilling loss continues making headlines three days after the, air, after the airline released its full year results. The historic loss was fueled by a combination of exponential growth that did not translate into returns and left the national carrier bleeding. So what is the way forward? KTN's business reporter sat down with a panel who shared their views on how the national carrier can regain its lost wings. So should Kenya Airways lease or should they own some of the aircraft that they operate? In my view, K KQ had no business owning the, f the, f the fleet yeah. because it's very expensive and for your balance sheet, it, it, it usually affects your balance sheet. For me, should they should have just leased. And for that, the ones that are still operational and they are, they are in their books, they should sell and lease it back, and release some of the cash to use it in. And the other thing is also that now we can see it's no longer sustainable to have any more debt in, the, in, the, in their balance sheet. And the rights issue is out of the way. Mm -hmm. No one is going to, it's highly geared. So for me, they should also look for a strategic partner, an investor. Where is it time but that perhaps KLM exited as a shareholder of this airline? Um, I think their strategic partnership is no longer strategic. I think they need to cut their losses with KLM. Um, we're seeing they're also struggling within their universe and some of the problems that the KQ is facing has been onboarded to them by KLM. So there is some, um, um, some contention between that partnership. I do think we need to look for a more wider strategic partnership um, Possibly um, even in terms of uh, if we see uh, equity injection um, or capital injection from uh, another strategic partner that can be offshooted off into equity within the long run instead of KQ or incurring more debt. Uh, in regards to the bailout issue, I think the government is setting a, a bad precedence in general by bailing out most companies that are um, untenable. I think um, uh, the issue with Kenya is, is that yes, there is that whole too big to fail syndrome, but we need to know that Kenya is. is Intrinsic, uh, intrinsically shaped within a, a wide sphere of the economy. Yep. They are supporting uh, local businesses throughout um, and I do think that uh, the amount of economic support that Kenya always brings is more um, equitable than most of the other companies that have bailed out. CEO Mbuvi was on the interview and actually saying we are actually on debt to pay staff. So you look at it from a cash flow management kind of position, what next? Well, their problem is primarily operational, yeah. and they have got to put, maintain their fleet at an optimal, optimal level. Um, 
you, you, I think for me the biggest hurdle right now is try to get the average uh, carbon factor up to plus 70 something percent uh, from where it is right now. Um, and and the, the, way, the one way to do that is to boost their marketing, uh, re review their marketing strategy. But I think they should also concurrently think about, uh, uh, you know, downsizing. As long as we wind up, uh, what next for KQ? What, what should happen? What do you want to see in the next even six months? Just to give assurance that this airline is headed in the right direction. Yes, uh, and, and uh, the question about the bailout, because Kenya Airways for us, I really think it's important for Kenya Airways to, to survive. Uh, the mistakes that have been made in the past, because strategically uh, where Kenya Airways is placed, it's at, a, at an advantage in terms of connecting even West Africans to the Far East. So the losses, yes, they're there, but to me, because I'm convinced it's mismanagement, I feel if government is to be an active partner, because what they've been doing is have, sitting in the board and really not participating in, 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 in and be having an interest in whether Kenya Airways is doing well or not. So if they are going to bail out Kenya Airways, which they should, because I don't think we should allow the airline co to go down, they should ensure that whatever, whoever is running that company Heads has, has the necessary experience, and this one I've insisted on because it's in the operations manual, yeah. the requirements are there. So why get somebody who knows nothing about the, the airline industry, especially now when you're in a hole? If you want to get out of that hole, get somebody who knows how, how to climb out. So for me, I think we should do our best to ensure that the airline survives. However, there need to be changes. Otherwise, as I said before, it's pouring water into a bucket full of holes. <laughs> and that's about Kenya Airways. Now, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers has struck a deal with the Kenya Revenue Authority to allow manufacturers who missed out on excise licenses to continue production. In the deal struck late Friday, manufacturers will be allowed to continue with production as the taxman reviews the applications. KRA has, however, asked manufacturers yet to get their licenses to lodge appeals before they can receive interim permits to allow operations. The taxman has also asked manufacturers to attach letters from the county governments to their applications as evidence that their factories are located in designated areas. KRA two weeks ago published a list of companies licensed to produce goods for sale in the country with many would-be manufacturers missing from the list. Among the most vocal aggrieved companies was Kiroshi Breweries Limited, which suspended operations for close to two weeks. The Kenya Association of Manufacturers, which represents close to 850 members, last week faulted the taxman for arbitrarily introducing requirements for the licensing at the start of the year, long after some companies had made the applications. Of the list released by KRA, only 85 manufacturers and 48 importers had managed to get a license to import or produce goods locally. And now let's take a look at how the Kenyan markets did perform and how the Kenyan shilling traded today against the dollar and other currencies. That's it for the markets. Thank you all for watching KTN Business. For more news, log on to our website, standardmedia.co.ke or ktnnews.com. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Good night. Sofapaka and three crucial points in their quest for this season's Kenya Premier League title as they emerged 2 nil winners over City Stars at the Kenyatta Stadium in Machakos. In Nairobi, AFC Leopards came from a goal down to earn a point against Bandari at the Nyayo National Stadium.
FC Leopards invited Bandari to the Lions Den with the Ingwe Kin to go forth on the KPL log. With both teams coming from a backdrop of defeats in their previous encounters, the match presented them with a chance to boost their morale. Bandari were given a boost with AFC head tacticians Ravko Logarusic missing from the touchlines, and the Dockers took the inspiration and five minutes into the game they registered their first attempt on goal. Tahir Muidin's boys could have broken the deadlock on the 20th minute, but Ingwe shot stopper Lucas Indecho was in hand to deny Bandari. The Dockers keeper was also called into action a few minutes later, denying Ivan Anguyo the chance to break the deadlock before the breather. In the second half, Bandari striker Shaban Kenga gave his side the lead after FC goalkeeper fumbled with the ball. <laughs> Ten minutes later, FC equalized through Jackson Sale. I was in the first place. I was in the first place. Tuajisifia draw ili atungelishinda. Kipindi cha kwanza tumekuwa na nafasi kadhaa za kufunga na tukufunga. Na naamini mechi ijao kama mambo yatakuwa mazuri tutaibuka na ushindi. In another encounter so far Pakai Mwatu Neil Victors over City Stars at Kenyatta Stadium in Machakos. Collins Shivachi gave Batoto Bamungu the lead in the first half. Minutes later David Mbakia doubles so far Pakai's lead to give them a win. The win moves of Apaka to third on the Kenya Premier League log. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports. So not so good news, especially for Kenya. The world of athletics is facing a massive doping scandal linking athletes from around the world, including Kenya, with suspect blood tests. Reports indicate that 18 Kenyan athletes could be under investigation. A report published by a German media revolved, re revealed that a third of medals in endurance events, which Kenya takes part in at the Olympics and World Championships between 2001 and 2012, including 55 gold medals, were won by athletes who recorded dubious blood tests, but none of them had the medals stripped the paper alleged athletics kenya has reacted sharply to the allegations in a press statement sent to newsrooms athletics kenya pointed out that the documentary was made largely based on private and confidential data as well as forged documents ostensibly from ak uh, which are now subject of investigation by the relevant authorities using newer testing techniques that did not exist at the time there are allegations made no evidence we want to look into them seriously because to say that in athletics between 2001 and 2012 we did not do a serious job with the test is laughable. I do not know what we are dealing with. There's no clear evidence to explain the Sunday Times and ARD reports, but the allegations are the latest setback to tarnish the multi-billion dollar world of sport after the scandal at soccer's global governing body FIFA. The report's timing has also been questioned, coming just three weeks before the World Athletics Championships, where Kenya will be represented by 47 athletes. Meanwhile, the president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, said that his organization will continue with its zero-tolerance policy for medalists if doping allegations are found to be true. We will continue to, to monitor this uh, until and including uh, the Olympic competitions. Athletics are a central part of the Olympics, the only sporting event that rivals soccer's World Cup. Lin Washira KTN. As Kenya Harlequin strolled on to win the 51st edition of the Christie Sevens at the RFUEA grounds, another team, Cabras Sugar, was making headlines of its own. The Western Bay side showcased their new international signings from Fiji, despite being knocked out of the main cup in the quarters. Cabras Rugby Club was the surprise team of the 2014 season, reaching the Kenya Cup finals. The Western-based outfit defied all odds to make it to the finals, knocking out tournament favorite Stoff Rainakuru in the semi-finals. The finals, however, were a different ball game for the side which was playing its first season in Kenya Cup as they lost to KCB which was arguably the best sports club of the year. The Millers have since moved on from the Kenya Cup loss and their main goal is to dominate Kenya rugby team. We know they are coming at us harder than last season. Number two, it has, it's a target we have set. We have to reach where we reached last year. 
then from there we'll plan. Number one, we know they're coming at us harder than last season. Number two, it has, it's a target we have set. We have to reach where we reached last year. Then from there we'll plan. The outfit has this season side four players from Fiji and hired an Australian manager. This is in addition to their current squad which is composed of Kenyan and Ugandan players. Fijians are uh, interesting players. They are sharp players. They are not that physical. It's not, it's not that hard to change a team. And uh, the players we have, with the experience, the experience that they have in sevens, they are, they are doing as much help. Cabras were knocked out of the Christie sevens in the main cup quarters and ended up losing the plate semis to South Molios. <laughs> With such acquisitions, Kenyan rugby is headed for a bright and more competitive future. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports. After registering wins against high-ranked Portugal and Spain in international test matches here in Nairobi, National 15th team captain Brian Nicoli says they are hoping to continue the impressive form at home when they play away to Namibia. The two sides lock horns on August 8th, where Kenya must beat the host to end the season on a higher rank as well as retain the African title. Uh, we fly out on Thursday early in the morning, but we get together again on Wednesday. We have two days to just relax and be with family and friends. Uh, Buddha the camp is okay, at least no injuries. Uh, everyone is geared up looking up to the challenge. We know it's going to be a hard game because they're going to play away, but everyone is ready for it. Yeah. If, if I can speak for the last four years we've been together, I think our, our away record was better than home because uh, like 2013 we won. We only had two games at home. We played Uganda home and away. Uh, then we went and played Zimbabwe, we played Namibia away, we won them, we played Madagascar away. So for me, I believe the only time last year is when we had a problem when we went away, we lost the last game. But I believe we've been able to correct whatever we, issues we had, the small mistakes that we had. So just tell the fans to keep on praying for us and uh, we're going to do what we love doing more. ...with Thika School of Medical and Health Sciences. The debate on the polio vaccination is the basis of our big question tonight and we are asking you tonight if you think the government should stop the polio vaccination campaigns, the, the poll results there on your screen split right down the middle, 50% yes, 50% no. Quite a lot of feedback. Errol Juma says, why should it stop when the aftermath of polio is well known? Let it go on. Erika says, just asking. Will the Catholic Church pay for all the medical bills, lifelong suffering that can't be avoided by a vaccine? Sylvia Coco says, no, it shouldn't. Polio is a real menace. This church should also know their limits and stop critics on vital health issues. At, uh, George Gitonga says, I'm a Catholic, but I think the government should continue with the polio campaign. Um, this is Omosh says, what's so bad in addressing the concerns raised by the Catholic Church? What is being hidden? At Makamba Kivindio says, if for sure there is nothing to hide, a joint testing by the government and the church is the way to go. Charles Kimani says, no, nope, the vaccine is uh, WHO approved. It has the blessings of technical bodies. And it raises the question, so then what's the alternative for Kenyans? And finally, Ruben Mwangi says, I think the government should engage all stakeholders in the sector. What are they afraid of? Those are your opinions on our big question tonight on whether or not you think the government should stop the polio vaccination campaign. Brawl with us today in any of our branches countrywide. Thika School of Medical and Health Sciences, nurturing professional excellence. And that's where we leave it on KTN Prime. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Linda. For good.